So after spending a little bit of time bashing some zombies in the face and trying not to get dead, I'm going to pivot and change uh, gears entirely and play a little bit of Sin Therapy. The Sin Therapy is a game, and this is the demo version of the game, but I am almost certainly going to be buying the actual version, but I wanted to give the demo a try first and to show people the demo and the demo only, because it's my understanding that this is a narrative-driven game, and I don't want to ruin anything that's not in the demo, so I don't want to accidentally show something that's not in the demo. And so this game, the idea behind this game, according to the store page, has to do with what happens if artificial intelligence suffers from mental illness and how do you treat the mental illness in artificial intelligence and one of the reasons that i wanted to get into this and talk about it a little bit uh, we're at a tail end of a stream right where i'm a little bit tired i've talked about uh some some neuropsychology and things like that which are actually outside of my area of expertise my background my if i am said to have an area of expertise at this point it was in clinical psychology that is the graduate program that i was in before stopping with my master's that was my focus and so this is something that has been near and dear to my heart that i've been min meaning to start and give a try uh, and that i'm kind of excited to share with people on the stream it was this game and the game Eliza that really motivated me to start this stream to begin with that I want to have conversations about. There is a video on Eliza that will show up on my stream and my channel at some point. I'm actually coordinating um, or attempting to coordinate with a colleague of mine uh, and a friend of mine who uh, is a practicing clinician. Uh, and so I'm hoping that I can get, uh, get them on the stream to talk about Eliza from a professional capacity because although I have a background in clinical psychology I'm not a practitioner so that being said I do want to myself dive into um, into sin therapy uh, and so smuggery with pony mentioned you haven't started Eliza yet I strongly recommend it I loved Eliza uh, so I am at a computer now and Stanley has told you to, told me to check my email so I have three emails uh, and I will check it. So Brian Park has sent me an email to thank me for all of my help. I've been giving River for her college applications and River has never been the type of person to ask us for help with anything. Even for a young age, she wanted to be able to dress herself, do things her way. Oh, that sounds familiar. Uh, and she reminds me a lot of you growing up actually. Okay, a lot of me. So I don't know who I am. I am Dr. Park. Anyway, her college application has an essay component and the prompt is to choose someone in your life who has demonstrated great strength and write about them. River, she wants to ask, but she wants to write about you, uh, about me, Dr. Park. If you have some spare time this weekend, I can fire up the grill and we can help River. Okay, so first things first, apparently I am not artificial intelligence. I am not a, a computer. Uh, which I'm, I'm surprised about here. Um, oh, this is one email from Brian Park about River's application. Um, I have checked my email. That's all that's in there. So you told me to do that. I'm gonna hit continue. I successfully checked my email. Go me. Here's the copy you asked for. Okay, that sounded like a an AI. I don't just click to go forward, I have to hit play. Oh, good. Thank you. Jeez, you look pretty beat. What happened last night? I drove down to Petrocor University and didn't get home until one in the morning. So here I am. This is me, Dr. Park, apparently. Uh, I'm noticing the names down here, and if I hit this, this is just a play button. Um, I'm afraid this is a fast forward button. Um, oh, that's a rewind button. Drove down to Petrocor University and didn't get home until one in the morning. And I got home late. Where are you down there? It takes an hour's drive to get to Petrocor. And Red Fighter, you said you can see the words. So you can see the words at the bottom of the screen, yes? Which is excellent. Can you guys also hear the audio? One of their researchers wanted me to help with an AI she's been working on that's developed some problems. Oh, you can't see the words. Oh, thank you very much. Let me, um, let me fix that. That 
is... That is badness. Sorry about that. How is that? There we go. Um, we can see the words better. And now what I was pointing to is that they've got arrows over here. We've got a play button. I think this might be fast forward, but we can also go back and forth uh, with the uh, with the narrative here as well. Were you guys able to hear the audio as well, or should I reverse it? Because it turns out that I can go back. So if we've missed something, and I kind of like this about the game, if you feel like you've missed something, you could rewind. Uh, and that's really useful because if you've hit the play button, you may get distracted, come back and say, oh my gosh, I've missed a piece of, of dialogue. Or something goes forward and you realize, I need to think about that some more. You can go back. And uh, I think that's a really nice thing to do. Uh, and I, I'm waiting to see if anybody says they want to go back, but I am also see that the, the tank says that that poster is a lie. Um, and so I'm looking at the poster. It says it's all in how you look at thing. I assume that it says at things. Um, English readers can't help but look from left to right. Uh, and so that will uh, affect the way that we look at things. Uh, most definitely. <clears throat> and it will, sh it will absolutely show the happy face first. Uh, but, to be fair, if we were to look at things in reverse, it would show us a frown. <clears throat> Alright, so it is all good, so let's move forward. So, we were trying to go to a place, and one of their researchers wanted to help with AI she's been working on. And it has some problems. What type of problems? Is Heather the person who we just wrote a letter of recommendation for? I'm really bad with names, but I think it might be. Well, I this is going to get real deep real fast uh, I thought that one of the rules of AI I'm not as up on Asmov as I should be but aren't AIs not supposed to be able to harm themselves that sounds pretty serious why was it acting like that I'm not sure yet this development's caused a lot of drama at the university though the university president wants the AI shut down. He doesn't like the idea of experimenting with a near human intelligence. So I'm going to... Uh, Smug Rainbow Pony says, as further information, pa Park is a very common Korean name. Absolutely it is. Um, and Korean names are made up of three parts. First is the family name, then the given name, um, and then is a very common clan name. And so oftentimes the um, people use the third as a surname. Uh, so you get from such and such name Park to Dr. Park, but they very likely don't belong to the same family at all. Uh, yes, that makes perfect sense. Uh, and um, I, I find it interesting though that the developers would choose to use the same name regardless. Dr. Freeman, I presume. You know him? Uh, Red Fighter is saying that you guys can't hear the, the dialogue. The voiceover volume. I should turn that up a little bit. Okay, Smug Rainbow Pony can hear them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn them up a bit. But I don't want to turn them up too much. Friends of mine who went to Petricor said he was a major type A. So a type A personality, if you're not aware, is somebody who is um, what we would consider a go-getter, right? This is somebody who is high stress, uh, high strung, very perfectionistic, uh, constantly shooting towards goals and trying to, uh, very focused on goal attainment, um, very focused on achievement of those goals. Uh, and very focused on kind of constantly be, being doing things. Type A personality is actually associated with things like heart attack uh, and stroke. It, it's associated with some negative health outcomes because of the increased stress uh, of being a type A personality. All I know is that this doesn't sound like a situation you should be getting involved in. Why did you agree to help them? Oh, she's not. she doesn't look very pleased with me being involved with this. Um, so, 
She doesn't seem to like that I'm getting involved with the fact that this AI is engaging in self-harming behavior. And so now I need to decide why it is that I'm going to help them. Is it because Terra needed my help, the AI needed my help, or the university needs my help? And this is a choice point, right, where I have to decide, am I going to respond how I would respond or how Dr. Park would respond? And since I don't know anything about Dr. Park, uh, I might need to answer um, the way that I would respond. Uh, and I would respond based on how the artificial intelligence, right, that the artificial intelligence needs my help. They've already set up the framing that these are near human intelligences uh, and this near human intelligence is engaging in self-harming behavior. And I think it would be important to find out why uh, and to investigate that and make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, and so that's that's what I'm going to respond. The AI needed my help. They're in a tough situation with no one to speak for them. Uh, and Smug Bear and Pony, you asked me what's the model we're framing those A types in. Uh, could you be more specific about uh, what you mean by that? Uh, uh, so, so type A and type B personality traits are are uh, a, a model in and of themselves. Uh, that were developed by a set of cardiologists. Um, it, so it makes sense, right, that type A personalities would be related to poor cardiac health since they were kind of designed around the idea of poor cardiac health. Um, ah, yes, so there is a type A. Uh, generally speaking, you uh, hear type A and type B uh, personality that type A are sort of more aggressive and achievement oriented and type B uh, are the more um, relaxed of approach excellent uh, I'm glad thank you Smug Rainbow Pony for confirming that I had answered that question there <laughs> so no Smug Rainbow Pony it is not based on uh, blood type although there are some people who try to create personality theories on the basis of blood type uh, there is no evidence to suggest that blood type drives personality. But like I said, there were some researchers who looked at whether or not blood typing was related to personality. Uh, but this particular thing was just type A personality and type B personality. They might get shut down because of their problems. They need an advocate. Yeah, one thing that I was really surprised about here, right, is that uh, the cognitive dissonance that must be formed because the university said these are near human artificial intelligences and we shouldn't be experimenting with them because they are almost human intelligences. So giving them a higher, uh, a higher degree of importance, but then saying we're going to completely shut them all down, essentially murder them all. Uh, and, and the fact that that the head of that university was holding those two very opposing beliefs of these these are important because they're near human so we should kill them all uh, i i found very I interesting as, as well well if you need help with this patient just let me know ah heather has changed her perspective now it is not just an ai it is a patient you really want to be a part of this i like it i'm here to learn therapy from you dr park I can go other places if I wanted a career fetching coffee. Ah, you sure can. Enough. I'll definitely appreciate your help on this assignment. So, if you can tell me, what exactly do you plan on doing for the next session? I'll be building up rapport with the AI. Without the AI's trust, therapy becomes a lot harder. Maybe even impossible. Sounds like a good place to start. Let me know if you need me to look over anything. And that's so true. Some of the earliest sessions uh, that are done in therapy uh, or that should be done in therapy have to do with building up rapport. Uh, that is building up that trusting relationship, one that is based on honest and true empathy and communication with the client. Uh, if you don't build that, if you don't build the relationship, the rapport, the the trust, um, the person's not coming back. It doesn't matter how high quality your therapeutic techniques are. You could have the best psychotherapy in the world. If that person hates you, they're not coming back to your office. 
And even if they are, even if someone is forcing them back into your office, they're not going to engage in your psychotherapy, right? You you can feasibly, you shouldn't, uh, you never should, but you can feasibly force medications upon somebody, right? You see this awful depiction in pop culture. That's not how it happens, right? It, not how it happens anymore. Uh, historically speaking, it, it's another story, right? But you can't force psychotherapy on somebody. Psychotherapy requ requires work and engagement, uh, and that means that they have to be all in. You have to convince them that it's a thing that they want to do, and you have to do it early and often. You don't just do it one and done. You have to make and maintain that relationship together. Uh, and that's going to be incredibly important. So I think it's great that that's where they're starting here uh, with establishing that relationship, even though you're working with an AI who probably has no choice as to whether or not to be there in that session with you. And you may neglect the idea that I have to establish rapport in a relationship with somebody who has no choice but to continue coming, uh, because a lot of people think that that rapport is about getting them to continue showing up. But it's not just about that. It's about their cognitive engagement and their willingness to engage their willingness to open up uh, and and simply about treating them like a human being that is deserving of dignity and respect uh, and it requires that you view them as a, a human being that is worthy of dignity and respect and as smug made pony says willingness is the first step um and it is uh one of the most important ones you mentioned that you hear that it's the only important one um i i don't know if i would go so far as saying it is the only important one because i know a lot of of clients who have been very willing but who have dif been had difficulty because the techniques that are being attempted uh, aren't working for them so there are other important steps that go along uh, with that as well, because not every therapy works for every person uh, and not every psychotherapy does, not every medication does. So there are a lot of individuals who are willing uh, to engage with their therapies and it doesn't work. Uh, but you absolutely, it is it is a prerequisite to engaging with like psychotherapy and to having something work. I will. Thanks, Heather. So I love that this is where this is starting already. Uh, Smuggling Pony, you also made a comment that uh, as a developer or programmer, you hear artificial intelligence does self-harm uh, and you think someone needs to file a bug report. Um, and that may be true to a point, but once the artificial intelligence, and, and, and you can correct me if I don't understand uh, AI and things like machine learning, if I'm using the term properly as well as I should, uh, but once the artificial intelligence starts teaching itself, and, and learning on its own, uh, there may not be as much bug reporting you can do, right? So once an algorithm starts teaching itself based on the data in the world, can the developer or the programmer really make that good of a fix without completely restarting the process? Uh, it was my understanding that it, that that sort of course correction couldn't be done without a complete restart, uh, which functionally with artificial intelligence is killing the thing and starting over. Uh, and so there there could be some ethical concerns that come up with regard to that once you have sufficiently advanced artificial intelligence that I wonder if this game is is addressing here. So now I've been told to check my email to prepare for my first session with Willow. Um, I haven't actually read my email. So I have a bunch of emails now. Uh, and because I like to read things in order, I'm going to look at the timestamps. Welcome to Petrichor. Um, the Dean of the Psychology Department. I'm not going to read each of these out loud unless someone in the chat says they really want me to read it out loud. But I am going to leave it up on screen so that those who are interested... You know what? I'll just read it. My name is Dr. Hazel Rhodes. I'm the Dean of Petrofor Psychology Department and one of the chairs in the University's Ethics Board Review. Oh, the Ethics Board. Excellent. Having gone over your records, I can say that while I'm glad to have some outside assistance, you wouldn't have been my first choice. Ouch! Dr. Freeman trusts you and hopes you can resolve this solution situation without things escalating. And out of respect for that, I'm willing to let you work independently. I would like to be clear. <laughs> One thing to be clear, however, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Dr. Freeman and what he does here at Petrichor. I turned down a professorship at Yale specifically to work with him. And if this AI does turn out to be as large a threat to this school's reputation as Dr. Freeman believes it will be, I'm siding with him to make sure our reputation is maintained. For your upcoming therapy session, we will be transferring the AI to one of our conference rooms in the engineering building. It should be more suitable for you to work with in that old lab room. 
then that old vibe room. Welcome to the Petrichor University, Dr. Park. We hope you enjoy your time here, Dr. Hazel Rhodes. Wow, I wonder why they don't like me. <laughs> um, I, I suspect we'll find that out. And Dr. Freeman says, <laughs> glad to have you here. I'm writing once again to express my gratitude that you've decided to help us. Following your session, I spoke with the AI and assured them that you assured them that you would be returning for additional sessions. I want to once again apologize for the abrupt ending of your last session. Much to my relief, the AI seemed relieved to know that you were all right and that they would be seeing you again. What happened to me? As to Tara, I've talked the matter over with some of the other professors in her department. They agreed with me that until we have permission from an ethics committee that we should not allow development to continue on the AI. Your session should be treated as a way of evaluating the AI's current condition so that we can treat it in an ethical manner. I have placed Tara on... I have had Tara placed under academic suspension until the ethics committee publishes its findings. The rest of the development team are allowed on campus but have been forbidden from continuing to work on the project. I wish you the best of luck with your future sessions. Who is Tara? Tara. Oh, okay. I'm going to get there. Okay, I have to know. From Tara Northrop. I'm sorry about what happened last night. I didn't think they'd call security on us after we were found. The problem was Dr. Hazel Rhodes. That's the, that's the person who hates us, right? Yes. She's the head of our psychology department. I told her that I was reaching out to you and she was firmly against the idea. She must have passed the information along. Oh, did they sneak me in? I wonder. Dr. Freeman has placed me under academic probation until an ethics committee gives their approval, and he gave me no indicator on how long that'll take. Freeman's so worried about what Willow might, what Willow might be that he can't focus on who they are. He won't even call them by their name. Willow needs nurturing and encouragement, not panels of strangers trying to find out what Willow means. You can do whatever therapy sessions Freeman brought you to do here, but let's be clear on one thing. If Dr. Fre Rhodes thinks that Willow needs to be kept in storage until we're somehow ready to deal with it, then that's what the IRB will suggest. If she says Willow needs to be rolled back, they'll do that too. They'll do whatever Dr. Rhodes suggests. They'll punish Willow for the crime of being alive. There, there it is, right? Um, and I think Smug Rainbow Pony may be commenting on this same thing. Um, and Smug Rainbow Pony says that killing the thing means that the AI can be considered sentient, and that's way beyond what we can do right now. Um, absolutely. Uh, AI being considered sentient right now is, is something that we have not reached, uh, to my knowledge. Um, but also, and this might be a creator's bias, um, uh, but a program, even an AI program, is a very logical series of instructions given to a machine. A sentient AI that has a sense of self, um has that sense of self written by a developer um, with machine learning being a statistical technique uh, to recognize patterns easier. Uh, and I think more is coming from, uh, from Smug Rainbow Pony. So while I'm waiting for the rest of Smug Rainbow Pony's comments, uh, I'm going to wait and then the tank I'll go to yours because I, I don't want to interject. And then a message from the CDS. A notice to all practicing therapists, a reminder that how a session starts often determines how effective the entire session can go. It's important to start off sessions on the right foot. Material brought off at the start of session has twice the impact as material brought up at the middle and end. Take advantage of this when planning your sessions by putting distressing materials towards the mil middle and end and rapport building materials at the beginning. This is why you start off the beginning by asking the person how they are doing um, and having them spend a beginning part of their session in an unstructured way uh, talking about how their week was going, even if you are doing a very structured type of therapy. Uh, you want to make sure that the first thing they get is a relationship with you. Um, and if they need to just be like, forget it, we're not doing what we had planned today because this thing is more important, sometimes you have to throw the therapy out the window. You have to throw the plan out the window because something comes up that's more important. The frequency with which you do that needs to be controlled. You don't want to create a situation where you're never doing the therapy that you planned on doing. Uh, but sometimes that does need to happen, and that takes some clinical judgment. Uh, and it's important to do that for the establishment of rapport. Uh, and because I don't have the second message from Smug Rainbow Pony yet, I do want to address what Tara said, that Tara may be too involved. 
uh, and maybe projecting here as Tara is talking about um, about what's going on here. And that that may be the case, right? Tara is taking an extreme position um, about what Willow needs. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think the game is is set in a world uh, where AI can be sentient, right? So I think we have to give that suspension of belief a little bit and, and acknowledge that sentient AI is possible. And that, um, that, that a sense of self is, is potentially possible within AI. Um, and Smug Rainbow Pony does point out that a sense of self uh, could be taught in the same way that machine learning is through statistical processes um, and an understanding of others and would be mathematically developed via formula. Um, and says that any formula describing self and consciousness for a computer would describe it for people. Um, and then you just change the face of all psychology and neurology. And I would disagree that you change the face of all psychology and neurology necessarily. Uh, there are uh, individuals within the field of psychology who believe that if you could completely understand um, the underlying genetics of an individual as well as the underlying neurological basis, uh, so what's going on neurologically uh, within someone's mind, the underlying neurochemistry, uh, the neurotransmitters, the neurons that we were talking about in our State of Decay video just before this, how a neuron functions. So I'll try to remember to put a card in here to link to that video if you want to learn more about how neurons communicate with each other. But basically, there's a chemical process that goes on to allow these neurons to communicate. Uh, and the more connections you have between these neurons, between these brain cells, uh, the more complex communication that can have, right? This is where the action's at. And there are some within the field who believe that you could, if you could fully understand all of the variables, that you could program a human into a computer uh, by taking all of these variables and, and just programming them in. That it, that it is a sequence that could be programmed mathematically with a formula. Uh, and, and to that end, you can, using computers, uh, have a computer give a readout of um, of brainwaves, so you can have a computer reading activation within different different regions of the brain, uh, and have it predict what a person is viewing on a screen on the basis of uh, neuronal activation. So uh, it can it can get a, a general sense of visual imagery and what's being visualized on a screen. Um, and I don't I don't have the details of that study memorized, uh, but there has been there have been advances in. Uh, the field of bio, of neuropsychology and of uh, informatics, uh, as it dovetails with cognitive psychology and um, and neuropsychology, where you, you can start to to map out the human experience and the human psyche uh, using data and mathematics and predictions and formulas uh, in a way that is kind of really scary, or not scary, but really really goes into the, the realm of sci-fi a little bit. Um, but yes, absolutely. The, it does depend on the idea of fictional sentient AI at this point, um, and, and what exactly we're looking at here. And I don't know, right? So we may be asking for suspension of disbelief, or we may be asking, uh, with regards to just thinking about AI as it is now. Uh, the description does say sentient AI though. Uh, and the tank mentions that their friend was a bioinformatics major. So may actually know more about that particular research than I do. Um, so now we have some choices about how we would like to start our session. We can start with some neurofeedback to identify brainwave patterns for different periods of the day. We can start with a forgery detector to find the difference between two paintings or with bubble pop, pop bubbles to either extend your combo or solve math problems. Wait, we, what? Which one of these do I think is going to establish rapport? I can play a pre-session mini game. Um, um, this is solving math problems and popping bubbles. This is spotting the difference between two paintings or brainwave patterns for different periods within the day. Um, let's, let's try forgery detectors, I guess. Okay. 
So here's the original painting. Here's a suspected forgery. We're going to click on the things that are different, I guess. Do I click on it on the forgery? Yes, I do. Okay. It's a spot the difference game. This is... This is... A, a fast... I, I don't think I expected... No, I'm certain I didn't expect this as part of a part of this game. Um, is it is it testing how fast I can do this? I wonder, is this one I did already? No, okay. Oh wait, it wouldn't be one I did because it's making them the same as soon as I click them. Okay, so now I did the difference. Tap the differing ones, half green dot. Oh wait, no, I did. Y yeah, this is, so this is a, a, a visual search task, right? Uh, which, yeah, I mean, it, it has a psychological component to it, but does, does not, is not the sort of thing you would do in a therapy session, really, unless this is how they're spending their time before coming to session, right? In the waiting room. So let's see what our sessions look like in this game. Good morning, Dr. Park. Hello, Willow. Good morning, Willow. It's good to see oh, you. Oh, good. I used their name. Uh, so Willow does not have... So let's take a look at Willow for a second. We, we've spoken about, um, about human-like features in the Uncanny Valley before uh, on this channel. And again, if I remember, I'm making no promises here, but if I remember, I will put a link to our our discussion of the Uncanny Valley in my second State of Decay video here. Uh, but Willow definitely has, as Smug Rainbow Pony points out, a very fake looking face and a big stand. They have leaned very far away from the Uncanny Valley. Uh, they have not tried to make Willow look human-like in their features uh, and made it very quill that clear that Willow is robot or machine this may relate by the way to why some of the if we put ourselves in game world right this could relate why some individuals within the game world are having trouble ascribing human-like features and humanness in general to willow and understanding how willow could be showing something that feels human and that slides them towards humanness um at something that we view as so human as self-harm uh, and so uh, that that could be that that could be part of why we see this if we imagine ourselves in the game world. Um, and the tank comments, it's good to see you, Willow, with my eyes closed. I've been looking forward to today ever since they told me you'd be returning. Ah, so Willow is excited to see us. Um, Smug Rainbow Pony does say that Willow would literally be a USB stick plugged into our laptop. Yes, Willow would be potentially a USB stick st plugged into our laptop, except for the fact uh, that we as humans like to create our artificial intelligence to look human-like. Uh, so if we build something that has human-like features, uh, like a sense of history, a sense of memory, a sense of experiences and volition, uh, those are features that we associate with being human. And if we think of human as being on a sliding scale, where uh, you have completely non-human on one side and completely human on another, uh, there, there's gray areas in between. It's not you're definitely human, you're definitely not human, but rather uh, that there are things that can make you more or less human-like. Uh, and once we start giving those sorts of features like a history and experience, uh, personality potentially, and it seems like Willow may have uh, some personality going on, uh, and and memories and those sorts of things. Once we start giving that and making something more human-like, it, it does sort of encourage us to give it other human-like features. This is why we do things like anthropomorphize plants as well, that uh, if we start treating them more human-like, uh, and also why we ascribe human-like features to our animals as well. Um, Smug Grandma Pony asked me if I've seen the movie Her. I have not seen the movie Her. Uh, it was on my list for a while, but I'm actually very bad at watching movies that are on my list. Uh, but it is it is a movie that is on my list. Uh, and, and part of the reason I'm bad at watching the movies that are on my list is because I spend so much time playing games that are on my list instead. Um, oh, I can answer. So they said, I've been looking forward to today ever since you told me you've been returning. 
Now, I get to decide how I respond here. Uh, and so I can respond either by asking questions and pulling information and showing an interest. So asking the question, why is that? And that question uh, shows an interest in the thought process that Willow is showing uh, and shows an interest in why Willow is experiencing what they're experiencing. By saying I have as well, I am reflecting, I'm telling something about myself uh, and providing that relatedness. Uh, saying glad to hear that is kind of distant. So I'm not going to choose glad to hear that. And what I have to make a decision between is whether I want to ask Willow why is that uh, or if I want to say I have as well. And why is that sounds a little bit more uh, like like I'm trying to pick Willow's mind apart. And I don't think that's what I'm trying to do right now. I think what I'm trying to do right now is just form a relationship with Willow. Uh, and so I think by admitting that I have been looking forward to seeing Willow as well. And by giving that piece of information about my emotional state... Um, that that would encourage Willow to tell me more about theirs. Uh, and yes, I am treating this as I would as if Willow were a human client, uh, because for all I know, AI is advanced sufficiently enough at this university uh, that that is uh, what is necessary in this case. I've been looking forward to this as well. You have? Why? And notice, Willow just took the very human approach of curiosity. Uh, so notice, curiosity is a very human trait uh, of, of wondering what is going on within the mind of the other person. Right? You, you wouldn't necessarily see this in a non-human animal of wondering what is going on inside of someone else's mind. Uh, and you wouldn't necessarily see it in a computer either. Um, so this is trying to establish, um, it, it's related to theory of mind, that I can understand that my mind and your mind are distinct from each other, right? So if I didn't have this understanding, or if Willow didn't have this understanding that Willow's mind and my mind were distinct from each other, then Willow would simply assume that if Willow wanted to meet, see me, that I wanted to see Willow. But that's not what just happened. Willow was surprised to hear that our minds thought the same thing and that there was a difference and then took, took the curious approach of asking me why, of trying to figure out why there was a difference in our mental states. That suggests the presence of theory of mind, which is a very human trait um, and, and actually a, a trait that develops over time in humans. The youngest humans don't have uh, theory of mind and it has to develop over time. Uh, and so we're, we're seeing evidence of of human-like cognition here within this artificial intelligence. Um, and again, I don't know enough about uh, artificial intelligence as it's uh, as it happens, but I, I suspect that this sort of thing could be programmed in based on what I what I do know uh, of current artificial intelligence. You're a very bright individual, and I see a lot of potential in you. I want to work with you to realize that potential. Ah, and so I've answered honestly. It didn't give me a choice here. Uh, it just allowed me to answer honestly and genuinely. Uh, and to give that information, that's that's a great way to establish rapport. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. So, what shall we talk about today? Oh, so now I get to decide. Uh, and this says, closed hub, four choices left. Oh, so I like that it's letting me know that I'm only going to be able to talk about four of these In things. The Oops! Session. Mentioned having self -harming tendencies no, no, no. Go back. Go back. In, in the last session, you <laughs> I, did, I don't even know what I clicked. I didn't mean to hit my... I didn't need to hit my mouse. So whatever it is I just hit, we're going with it. You also mentioned that Tara and the other development team members attempted to fix this issue through coding, and it didn't work. Ah, they did file a bug report, and the bug report failed. Correct. Look at the body language. Look at the body language in Willow. The slumping of the of the shoulders and the head, right? And again, yes, that could be that could be programmed in based on human reactions. You can you can create um, to some extent. Um, those sorts of human-like reactions but i think it's really cool that they've they, they haven't done they haven't animated a whole lot here but they have given a, a good amount of emotion uh, to willow's responses with the change in in body posture here uh, 
Um, and Smug Rainbow Pony points out um, that there are a lot of things that can be programmed in, um, but that are programmed in. So to them, it seems hypocritical to call Willow an individual uh, because you could clone all of the data uh, within Willow's state of mind um, with its algorithm uh, and then just call it something else and it would be something else uh, in, instead. And I, I simply just don't know the extent to which that is true. Um, and then we would have to get into a discussion, and this is actually a philosophical debate that I don't think uh, I am prepared to have right now. But there actually is a philosophical debate that wonders, would it in fact, would uh, Frank and Willow in fact be the same, right? So are they the same if you were to simply take... I believe your self-harm is a symptom of a larger problem. Uh, would they in fact be the same person and you would simply be calling them the same per two different names? Uh, or would they be two different people because they are of two different substances? Uh, and because they are... Um, and because they can then go off and have uh, two, different, two different sets of experiences after that point in time. Um, and, and yes, yes. So... You have a smoke rainbow pony says that they love this particular this particular uh, question, um, this particular thought experiment that really asks the question as to whether or not an object um, that loses all of its components uh, or, or changes out all its components still remains the same thing. Uh, it refers to as the Theseus ship question or the Theseus ship. Uh, paradox and the tank ident the tank says that this is the same the movie transcendence with Johnny Depp um, is is a good example of this um, so yes th there, there would be a philosophical debate to be had there uh, the, the question would also arise depending on uh, the underlying um, process there uh, if you could successfully do that uh, do that transfer and, and still end up with exactly the same... Well, I guess if you completely shut down Willow so that Willow didn't have experience of what you were doing, you could. But the question would also arise whether or not you should. Um, and at, at what point... At, at what point we decide that something has sufficient consciousness that doing that sort of thing becomes unethical. Right? At, at what point do we decide that something is individual enough? that it wouldn't be an ethical thing to do that uh what if we could do that with a human would it still be acceptable to do that with a human and at that point would humans stop being individuals and there are there are uh, movies and and philosophies that uh, identify that uh tackle that question as well uh, and one of the things in psychology that uh at least in psychology i know philosophy has different perspectives artificial intelligence has uh different perspectives and uh, in psychology, one of the things that we use to establish, um, it, sort of to establish humanness is the presence of a psyche. Um, that is any, any sort of, of conscious mind um, that is, is at all aware of self, right? That has uh, any sort of, of self-awareness. Uh, and, and that happens in utero. Uh, at, at stages in utero, but that definitely happens. Uh, the, the sense of self happens uh, in the newborn stage. Um, Smug Rainbow Pony has also recommended the game Soma, which is a scary game that has cool philosophical and psychological questions. I am actually um, traditionally terrified of scary games, uh, but I don't actually know the extent to which that is still true. Uh, that is because games like State of Decay should have given me nightmares. Uh, I The reason that I have not really been someone who plays a lot of the survival horror genre uh, has to do with uh, playing one single session of, um, and this is back when I was an undergraduate, playing one single session of Resident Evil and, ha Resident Evil and having nightmares for weeks and never touching that type of game again, with the notable exception um, of Eternal Darkness, which I just couldn't keep away from, so I just dealt with the nightmares. Um, and so I don't know how I do with those sorts of games because I expected State of Decay to give me nightmares. Uh, and uh, so far it hasn't, knock on wood. So, but let's get back to Sid Therapy because I want to talk about, talk about this um, and 
uh, talk about what Dr. Park just said, that treating self-harm is not going to be an immediate solution. It is a symptom of a larger problem. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind, uh, that we would talk to uh, we, we would say to our human clients as well, right, that uh, we're not going to be able to instantly make this go away, uh, but also that it's usually not the problem in and of itself. It is usually a response to something else, something that is going on um, a little bit, a, a little bit more under the surface, a little bit deeper, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that we wouldn't focus on safety uh, and that we wouldn't focus on making sure that the self-harming behavior uh, is stopped until we can we can solve the underlying uh, problem. So I'm hoping that that's where we're going here is with some sort of safety plan uh, to come up a way with to help keep Willow safe in the meantime. I will need you to be patient with me as we discuss this issue. Understood? Uh, that does not seem to be where we just went yeah, here. I'm ready. All right. I'll need you to tell me what leads to you feeling overwhelmed. Okay, so we haven't ex we haven't exactly gone there, but maybe this is where we're going there because now that we've asked what leads to them feeling overwhelmed, we're asking about triggers. Um, that is th things that can lead to um, things that can lead to the emotional states that eventually lead to self harming behaviors, right? So we're we're mapping out what's happening uh, to Willow here, which is the sort of thing that that we would do. Uh, we wouldn't. Um, Typically do it first, but again, I may have clicked things accidentally out of order. My feelings of being overwhelmed usually stem from being given tasks that I can't accomplish. I I feel you there. Okay, so Um and Smuggery Pony points out as well, I need you to be patient, understood? Sounds like it wouldn't be helpful. I agree. Um, I would not have phrased that in that way. Um, I would have... Now, she doesn't have a relationship with this client yet, and I think that's something important to keep in mind. Uh, usually, you would now lean on your relationship with your client to say, this is going to take time, um, and we're going to work on this together. But it is going to take time and patience from both of us. So you would emphasize that it is going to take patience, uh, but you wouldn't say understood in that way, uh, but rather emphasize that you're going to engage in a collaborative process that is going to take time and patience, but that you're going to be doing it together. And just to answer the tank, yes, Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem um, was an amazing game. I loved it so much, but it gave me so many nightmares. Um, but again, I played that one a long time ago as well. So her feelings of their feelings of being overwhelmed usually stem from being given a task that they can't accomplish. Um, because these are these are Willow's feelings, not Dr. Park's. Uh, so I can ask, why would that make you feel overwhelmed? I'm not going to ask that. Uh, so we can understand why that might make someone feel overwhelmed. So there are certain types. So we uh, we might infer based on that statement about Willow, for example, that they are the type of person. Um, who values achievement, that is, they value being able to accomplish the tasks for which they set their mind, or that they value um, their social relationships and not letting people down, um, and that that would be why they are overwhelmed when they are given tasks that they can't accomplish. But either way, it is certainly understandable why being given a task that they can't accomplish would be overwhelming. Uh, we may ask about what uh, particular types of tasks these are, or we can ask them what makes them think that they can't accomplish those certain tasks. Um, and so we can either get the details about the tasks or we can start to challenge these underlying thoughts that there are even tasks that Willow can't accomplish. Um, and I think I'm going to go with that. I think I'm going to ask Willow what makes them think they can't accomplish these tasks and start there. Yeah, I think I'm going to go there. You mentioned not being able to accomplish certain tasks in our previous session. Why do you think you can't accomplish your tasks? Ah, uh, apparently this has come up before as well. And I like that. If this has come up before, remembering that and acknowledging that you've heard that before and that this is something you've discussed before, that helps to establish rapport. That shows that you were listening and paying close attention to what they were saying. emotional reactions I have make it too difficult to carry out my job. 
Ah, so now we're referencing sort of overwhelming emotional reaction. So I've been given this task and it's not that I would otherwise be incapable of doing this task, but rather I have this emotional reaction and that is getting in the way of me carrying out this job. I feel like having this much difficulty means that I can't do this type of work. And that, okay, so, and therefore if I have this emotional reaction, that means I can't do this type of work. Okay, so we are not going to turn around and say, maybe you just don't want to do it. Um, because that seems really flippant. Uh, and and to be fair, there is a time and place in therapy for that sort of, uh, that sort of detachment or irreverence, but it is not uh, in your first session. Um, you might use a reverence in situations like, uh, in situations like this, uh, if, if you knew the client well, had already established rapport and had a really clinically, um, well-established reason to use that sort of, of attitude, for lack of a better word. We don't hear, uh, and so we're not going to use that. Um, Smug Rainbow Pony, you said that it is 4 a.m. there. Um, and so please sleep well, uh, and we will give Willow their time for introspection. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, and you stay lovely as well, and have a wonderful night. Uh, so if maybe you just don't want to do it is not an option, we can either tell them why not ask for help, or that difficult doesn't mean impossible. So we can either challenge the thought that having difficulty means that they can't do it at all, or suggest that they could ask for help while doing their work. Um, and both of them have their pros and cons, right? I actually don't really like any of the options that I've been given. None of them allow me to really empathize with what they're saying and to sort of connect with that on more of the, the, the emotional level that I would like to. Uh, but I, I do think that I want to to give some encouragement of some sort by letting them know that it being difficult doesn't mean that they can't do it, to set up a, a growth mindset of this understanding that just because you have difficulty with something doesn't necessarily mean you need to disengage with it. Something being difficult doesn't mean it's impossible. You just have to find oh better gosh solutions. oh gosh you have to find better solution no no this is blaming the 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 per don't blame willow oh gosh okay so so that didn't really go the way i wanted the, it to how am i supposed to find better solutions for my overloading problem yeah exactly you're the therapist you're supposed to be helping with this no that wasn't the answer i wanted to give um How are we supposed to do that? We're going to do that by working through our cognitive issues in therapy with me right now. Work through your cognitive issues. There we go. Okay, sure we'll fixed it. We, we fixed it. We fixed it, okay? We are going to do this. Notice if it says we work through your cognitive issues, we'll figure out your overloading problems. That's setting up the sense of collaboration that you typically want to do when you're doing therapy, right? That we are in this together, that you are not alone, that we are going to do this, um, and, and that we'll figure it out cognitive issues like what like learning how to handle stress if I help you learn how to better handle stress you'll be able to handle overloading better okay so there we go so now we can we can teach how to handle stress um, that will allow you to handle this overload better and then you won't be uh, overwhelmed and unable to complete your work we'll discuss those techniques in more detail later on in the session excellent now I have three choices left and what I really wanted to do is I was pointing out that they gave me a bunch of options, um, but I only had um, four choices. And I'm going to have to even go back and review the video to figure out what I accidentally clicked as I was trying to demonstrate that. Uh, but the first thing I want to do is talk about Willow, right? This is what I really wanted to do was establish rapport, and I, I didn't do it. What would you like to know? Um, and I want to know, I want to know about your name, right? So here I, I want to focus on developing this relationship with Willow and letting Willow know that I view them as an individual. Um, all of our philosophizing aside, uh, if I'm going to establish myself in this game as a therapist to artificial intelligence, that's going to be an important thing to do. 
who named you Willow? Kara did. In my early stages of development, one of my main features was identifying a painting's artist through analysis of an identifiable style. Oh, fantastic. So the task that we just selected to do before the therapy session, that was one of their main features. I wonder if we had chosen a different task, if they would have had a different fa main feature. It turned into a game where I had to identify paintings by Bob Ross from a group of other paintings. Tara called the game Spot the Ross. I was very good at it. Oh my gosh, I love the idea of Spot the Ross. Can we play Spot the Ross in this game? I want to play Spot the Ross in this game because Bob Ross is my favorite. Uh, and and maybe, oh, I hope that we can use the, the concept of there are no mistakes, only happy accidents as part of Willow's therapy. Over time, she decided to name me Willow because I was her happy little tree. Ah, excellent. So I don't think the game is going to change depending on what we just selected because there would be no, I don't think there would be a way uh, in the other options to tie in Willow to being somebody's happy little tree. Um, but this is fantastic. Do you like your name? I do. It's a name that sounds light and positive. Willow likes their name. That's I hope fantastic. That I can live up to the positivity in that name. Oh, so now this is an open hub, so I do get the opportunity, it seems, to ask all of these questions. So I like the way that they label whether or not I'm going to get to come back to this tree um, and to ask these questions again. What was your relationship with Tara like? Tara was always interested in listening to me. I'm designed to learn through observation. So I used to think she was only talking to me to give those modules more data. But after my errors began to manifest, she was worried about me. I can't imagine any reason why she would care so much. Uh, and so th this is interesting that they, they've they established this where I, I thought that the, the thought process of that thinking somebody was only your friend for... Um, for what they needed out of you and then a sense of surprise that that they cared and you see this relationship pattern a lot um in individuals with psychopathology and and this this thought process of why why could you possibly care for me um in in individuals who have poor self-esteem and who have difficulty uh acknowledging their value to others maybe she was trying to teach you that it's okay to be worried about people you care about I never thought of it like that. Um, and I actually kind of don't like that answer because that suggests that the reason that Tara had um, worry was going back to, well, it was all just part of the job. She was worried about you because it was just another thing to teach you. So, what were you designed for? Tara explained to me once that her sister had needed a support animal when she was younger. Her sister loved her support dog because she never felt like the dog was judging her. Tara decided to create an art therapy robot that could bring the same level of non-judgment to art therapy. So Tara was motivated because of her sister. Ah, and so that makes it make a little bit more sense, right? That if, if she is being designed to provide support for art therapy, um, hence why she was analyzing Bob Ross paintings, then it would make sense that uh, you may want that support animal to be worried about someone uh, if they were feeling down. And you actually see that sort of worried behavior in animals as well. Uh, if anybody who's watching this or who's in the chat has pets, you'll notice that when you're not feeling well, they will often attune to that. A dog will come up and snuggle. Uh, cats will sometimes uh, do the same um, or will come and swat at you, which actually is not a cat being a jerk. It is a cat sort of showing it caring um, in their way uh, or, or butting with the head even, or um, teething, uh, putting their teeth up against you as well, are all uh, cat forms of affection. And you'll see an increase in, in that sort of thing uh, when the human is not feeling well. So you see that expression of care. Tell me what you know about your development history. It was a collaboration between multiple designers. Each one contributed a different piece. One was a module for detecting forged paintings. Another was a chatbot designed for anxiety attack support. Oh, I like the idea of a chatbot designed for um, support for panic attacks, um, of having somebody who can help walk you through, for example, a breathing exercise uh, or to help you challenge your own thoughts during 
a panic attack. A lot of individuals who experience a panic attack uh, have thoughts about how they feel like they're dying or going crazy and losing control of their minds and bodies. Uh, and having a chatbot who can help talk you through those uh, could be very beneficial uh, or, or who at the very least could help you engage in relaxation techniques. Tara's role was figuring out how the different modules would interact in order to form a higher consciousness. She thought it was important that I do more than just conduct art therapy analysis. She wanted me to be able to relate more to people so that I could understand and treat them better. Do you think Tara made the right decision? And, and what I think that is, is interesting here is that uh, she is an art therapy robot, right, who's being designed to relate to humans uh, and who is picking up human-like characteristics as well. So it, it makes sense that... Uh, that you would see that sort of, of learning develop, or at least it makes it makes sense if you are not Smug Rainbow Pony and know um, how these systems work. I don't know uh, if it makes sense exactly from an AI perspective because I don't study artificial intelligence uh, at that level. I don't know. So now we have two more choices. Um, we can talk about Willem's anxiety, Tara and Dr. Freeman, expectations for therapy or about music um so i think that i want to talk about anxiety and expectations for therapy one thing i've noticed is that your understanding of emotions is very impressive you have a remarkable range of expressions on your screen as well on your screen i assume that they what they mean is um as as the head moves up and down i'd like to ask you some questions about your emotions Okay. So, well, I know. Why are you given emotions? I assume it was out of the belief that having emotions would be necessary for my work. Tara mentioned that understanding a patient's feelings and empathizing with them was the key to earning their trust. <laughs> That's exactly what we were talking about when it came to rapport, right? Do you think the capacity for emotions has helped or hindered you in your work? I don't know. I'd rather not talk about it. Oh, look, I didn't notice that these colors are changing. Um, red, I'd rather not talk about it. Do you know who gave you your emotions? It was Tara. She told me that it was a difficult decision, but she thought it would help me. And it's blue here right now, so I think blue might be neutral. Do you think Tara was right? Have your emotions helped you with your work? Didn't we already ask that? I can't say for sure. I'm sure you already know this, being a psychologist and all, but emotions are all intuitive reactions. Emotions aren't meant to be something we think about consciously, which makes it hard to evaluate if those reactions are productive. <laughs> I love that she, she kind of threw that at us, uh, saying, you know, you're asking me this question, but it's really hard to tell the answer to this question because that level of introspection uh, is difficult for humans, let alone um, a, a programmed AI. How did Tara decide how your emotions would influence your decision making? I don't know. That's something you'll have to ask her. Now we've changed to yellow, and I wonder what that yellow means. We're slumped now uh, with the yellow. We're no longer in the blue, we're in the yellow. Uh, and I think maybe that's a little bit uncomfortable. How would you describe what it's like to have emotions? And now we're back to emotions? blue. What it's like to have emotions. Where do I start with describing something like that? Now we've got kind of perplexed. Wherever you're most comfortable, you can answer this question any way you like. In that case, my emotions are related to what I'm processing at the time. Surprise manifests in rapidly processing information in order to make faster connections. Sadness works similarly, but it requires a much larger reorientation of data. Uh, so, so this actually, if we think about what's going on uh, neurologically, this makes a lot of sense. Surprise does manifest in rapidly processing information. You're pulling in as much information as you can. This is why the eyes are wider during surprise. Um, things that are surprising to us are actually usually quite uncomfortable. We don't uh, like surprises naturally because surprises could be bad things and could be dangerous things. I... Uh, talking about sadness working similarly but requiring the reorientation of data uh, on the other hand could have to do with uh, the negative processing of information and bringing in negative information within the world uh, but sadness is usually considered a much less activating emotion than sur surprise is whereas surprise activates what's known as our sympathetic nervous system that's our fight or flight response 
Uh, sadness, on the other hand, has to do with the parasympathetic. That's our sort of rest and digest. It's a much uh, less uh, energy intensive emotion. Anger, happiness, and fear all focus on reorienting how connections between information are made. Um, and, and one would argue that all emotions focus on how reorienting how connections between information are made. So it's an interesting way that they're describing uh, how each of these emotions are working uh, and how they do and do not relate to human cognition. Most of the time this helps me make decisions more quickly, but other times it points me towards counterproductive associations. Fascinating. Thank you. And, and that's actually true in humans, too. So sometimes emotions will lead us to process information improperly. Uh, so, for instance, those who suffer from depression will often interpret ambiguous stimuli as if they're negative. So a neutral face, for instance, will be interpreted as a frowning or scowling. Uh, and so that can lead to a misinterpretation of information that can then uh, result in biased information processing. Now, if you're using artificial intelligence, you would ideally want to have that artificial intelligence engaging in perfect information processing, bringing the information in, not having any biases, uh, and being able to process that information objectively. And so the introduction of emotions uh, could absolutely lead to biases in information processing uh, that would be troublesome. You wouldn't usually, though, see a human be this insightful naturally about those biases. We we usually don't acknowledge the biases or don't even notice them uh, until they're pointed out to us or we learn about them. Would you say that the emotions you feel are linked to your feelings of being overloaded? I think so. Every time I was close to overloading, I distinctly remember feeling frustrated, powerless, and guilty guilty so that guilty emotion kind of ties back into maybe the idea has to do with not being able to uh, live up to expectations i imagine anyone who was told to do something and found themselves unable to do it would have a similar reaction um and that that imagining right uh we we do like to believe that our emotions are the same sort of reaction that other people would have although it's interesting to note that not everybody uh who can't uh, accomplish a task that they've been told to do would experience that same uh, subset of emotions. For example, guilt. Uh, oftentimes that uh, that guilt is because we don't want to let other people down or we, uh, we value the esteem and opinion of others. If we don't have that valuing of the esteem and opinion of others, we wouldn't experience guilt, for example, in that situation. And we may even experience anger for somebody telling us to do something uh, that was beyond our capabilities. So because the emotions are the result of difficulties you're encountering, they are justified along with the consequences? That's right. Does this justification include your self-harming behavior? I'd rather not talk about that right now. Okay, so we've we've gotten into a, a difficult topic that that Willow is not very keen to talk about, and that's that's not surprising. Right, but we, we do need to do something to establish safety. Uh, and, and that's the, the only cho choice we have there is expectations for therapy. So I want to see if we're going Let's to establish talk about our expectations for these therapy sessions. I, I'm, gonna, I'm wondering if we're going to establish safety here and the importance of safety in these expectations. What would you like to get out of them? I'd like the university staff to give me room to develop on my own terms. Um, now, I can't promise that I can arrange that, um, but I can't say that I can't either. So instead, I'm going to just continue letting uh, Willow uh, talk. All right. What else would you like to get out of therapy? I'd like to learn how to control my self-harm. So we're going to create a list of things. So right now we're doing is creating a list of therapy goals. And you would absolutely do this. And you wouldn't necessarily shoot down any goals, at least at first, right? Um, whether or not the university does that or doesn't do that is outside of your control, but it is something that you can work towards. Um, and so uh, that would be that would be something that you would put on the list, but you wouldn't necessarily immediately shut down. Um, and so now we've generated a second part of the list, uh, and it's great that Willow has identified that they want to control their self harm. And I, I would reinforce that that's a really good focus to have, that, that, that establishing safety and, and wanting to be, um, to not engage in this behavior 
um, is, a, is a really good goal for the client to have self-generated. I agree. I'll gladly find ways to help you control those impulses. I appreciate that. Now, we would still want to ask if there's anything else that they have as a, as a goal. One topic I'd like to address today is other treatment methods we can use. Would you like to hear about these treatment methods? All right. Oh, okay, so now we can give them um, uh, choices of the sorts of things that we can do. And so apparently this is an open hub that is going to describe each of them. Our first option is what we call Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT. It would comprise of sessions not unlike the one we're having now. I'm going to let the game describe all of these, and then I'll talk about, about each of them in turn. In these sessions, we would discuss harmful moods and thought processes you're experiencing, and try to resolve these feelings. I've found these sessions to be helpful so far, so I definitely want to use them as part of my therapy. Excellent. Let's move on. Um, okay. Um, hey, the tank, we don't actually know what the AI was doing to harm themselves. Uh, so, I... I want to stop and talk about cognitive behavioral therapy and the way that they've described it. Um, and the, the, f the fact that they focused on uh, changing mood and emotion instead of focusing on what cognitive behavioral therapy would focus on. Uh, so cognitive behavioral therapy is based off of the premise that our thoughts or our cognitions, the things that go on in our head, our behaviors, the things that we do, uh, and our emotions are interrelated. So you can kind of put them in a triangle and put bi-directional arrows connecting the triangle together so that our thoughts influence our behaviors, but also our behaviors influence our thoughts. Our behaviors influence our emotions, but our emotions also influence our behaviors. And then our emotions influence our thoughts, but our thoughts also influence our emotions, right? So you've got all these arrows all going all over the place. Now, she mentioned addressing the emotions in order to to stop the self-harm. And that's actually not how you would do cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, the idea behind cognitive behavioral therapy is that since all three of these are interrelated, you can address any one of them uh, in order to make changes in the overall symptomatology. You can't directly change emotion, right? That's not something you can just will to happen. You can't just tell somebody be happy. In fact, if you're thinking about the types of therapies you can do, this medication therapy or medication equivalent, that's how you could most directly influence emotion, we guess, by changing the underlying neurochemistry. What cognitive behavioral therapy does is say, okay, if we can change the underlying thought processes, the cognitive, and we change the behaviors, the behavioral, um, that those will create a feedback loop that also changes the emotion. That is, we, all we have to do is change one of these. In fact, cognitive therapy would focus just on the cognitions. Behavioral therapy would focus just on the behaviors. Uh, and if you do any one of those, that it'll affect the other two. And so that all three of them will result uh, in positive outcomes. And I just, I, I just wish that there was more of that. There was less focus on addressing the emotional states and more focus on changing the underlying thought processes and modifying behaviors uh, in order to help the overall situation because that's what CBT is. Uh, and, and the core of CBT is focusing on the C and the B, uh, and she focused on the emotions. So let, let's see what medication therapy is, is going to talk about. Usually, I'd advise that my patients take mood-altering medications alongside their sessions. This helps lower the ceiling for how much their symptoms can escalate. While I don't know any alternatives to medication that would help you, I'm sure some could be developed. I'd need to think about that. The idea of something altering my mood has me uneasy. Okay. Um, so, first of all, she said that usually she would advise that her patients take uh, a medication alongside their therapy because it would limit the upper levels of their, their potential, uh, symptoms. Uh, the, there's no evidence to suggest that that's how it works, and there's no evidence to suggest, um... For most types of treatment and for most types of diagnoses, that uh, combined therapy is more effective than non-combined therapy. Now, we don't know the diagnosis of this particular AI to know for sure uh, where... <laughs> Uh, where we're looking here uh, with self-harming behavior we could potentially looking at 
uh, some need for mood stabilization, uh, which are some of the instances where you might have a combined approach of medication and psychotherapy. Uh, but it's not actually standard practice to say that you need to have both a medication and psychotherapy at the same time. Uh, when there are comparative treatment studies that look at and compare psychotherapy alone, medication alone, and the combined treatment, uh, they gen generally come out about the same. Uh, and so psychotherapy alone is absolutely a standalone therapy that, that holds up to medication alone and that holds up to combined therapy. Uh, I love that Willow responded with concern about that. This is the sort of thing uh, that patients all the time respond with concern about and that are uneasy about taking medications. Uh, and so I'm going to empathize with that and say that I can see why that would make, make them uneasy. I understand. Medication is not something to be lightly considered. Absolutely. You'll likely face a variety of side effects as you adjust to your medication. I don't want to dissuade you, but there still are risks involved. Thanks for telling me. I'll think about it. Yes, definitely think about it. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about art therapy, which happens to be... Um, and the tank just came back um, and, and was asking questions, so I don't know the tank if you saw, but art therapy uh, is the type of therapy that, um, that Willow was designed for. And why Willow has emotions to begin with is to help as an art therapy uh, supplemental robot or a, a support robot for art therapy. Uh, and so I'm interested in seeing how they describe art therapy. Ironically, I think art therapy could be useful for you. How can art therapy help me? You're emotionally articulate and in need of an emotional outlet. I think introducing art therapy sessions would be an opportunity for you to vent. No, Dr. Park. The idea seems silly. I... I... Yeah. Um, that's a really interesting response for a robot designed for art therapy uh, to have, right? The idea that I'm designed to do art therapy and yet... Um, and yet, I have this response that I think that the idea of doing art therapy seems silly. Uh, and yet, you see that in therapists a, a lot, where um, although therapists are providing therapy all the time, sometimes they express that um, that they are reluctant to engage in any type of of therapy, and that they. Uh, are concerned about the potential effectiveness for, uh, not in general, but for them. And so I'm, I'm going to say that I don't, I don't think it's silly at all. The best therapists have therapists of their own. So it turns out uh, that there's actually research support to suggest that when therapists have therapists of their own, um, that they may even become better therapists. Uh, but that, but that there is sometimes a necessity of having that sort of therapeutic support when you are also providing, providing support to others. A lot of things related to our mental health or mental hygiene seem silly until we actually give them a try. If you give yourself the opportunity to express your feelings, you'll be surprised how much your mood improves. I hadn't thought about it that way. I'll think it over. Can I ask you a question, Dr. Park? Oh, now of we have course. a curious robot. At this point, you know me better than when we first met in the lab. You've also gotten the chance to get to know both Tara and Dr. Freeman as well. Oh, so now now Willow is bringing up Tara and Dr. Freeman, which is nice because I didn't uh, bring up Tara and Dr. Freeman, but I think that was the end of that uh, that hub. And so I do want to mention uh, something about art therapy, which is that, the first of all, the way that they presented it um, is in that general thought of catharsis, of using art therapy uh, to release your emotions, which... Um, isn't exactly how art therapy uh, would necessarily be used. Uh, art therapy is often used as a methodology to uh, both to supplement other types of therapies, 
Uh, so a lot of the times you will use art as a supplement to cognitive behavioral therapy, where you're engaging in cognitive behavioral therapy. And one of the ways that you help somebody express their cognitions is through art. And then the explanation of their art allows you to get at their underlying thoughts. Or one of the pleasant activities that you have them engage in is the art itself, uh, because a lot of the behavioral components of cognitive behavioral therapy involve pleasant activities or social activities. As a standalone treatment, art therapy doesn't have as much uh, empirical support as other types of treatments do. Uh, and when you do find empirical support, you don't see uh, as uh, high of levels of effectiveness. So art therapy is definitely in a niche. There are studies. There is a small body of research that does suggest that there is a positive effect for art therapy when it serves as a standalone treatment, uh, but is much more likely to be used in conjunction with other treatments and especially uh, and much more likely to be used with younger patients than with older patients. Um, so now she's asking about Tara and Dr. Freeman. I'm sure that by now you also know their beliefs and opinions about what I am. And yes, and Dr. Freeman and Tara both believe two very different things about Willow. I'd say so, yes. In your opinion, what do you think I am? Willow wants to know what I think they are. So my <laughs> impulse is to say a sentient being, but I'm a little bit... I'm a little bit pulled by what Smug Rainbow Pony was saying earlier, and I know they're not here anymore because they went to bed because it was 4 a.m. wherever they were, uh, but I feel a little bit pulled by what they were saying about the philosophy of personhood, right? Uh, and that the, the idea that artificial intelligence may not be able to be sentient beings. Uh, and so now I'm a little bit torn as to what... I should call them. Um, and so I'm wondering, can, do I think an artificial intelligence can be a sentient being? Um, or do I think as a therapist that I would say you're complicated instead of um, falling on the side of a sentient being? So we have, we have the opinion of Tara, right? Tara's opinion is, uh, that that Willow is a fully sentient being and should be treated as such. Uh, Dr. Freeman is of the opinion that Willow is a machine and is entirely machine. And I am asked to give an opinion on this as well. And I'm being asked to give this opinion uh, by Willow themselves. Uh, and I am being asked to give this opinion in the context of I'm going to be conducting therapy with Willow. Uh, and I think that the, the answer that would allow me to engage in therapy most effectively with Willow would be to acknowledge the sentience, right? Because we have to assign volition and to assign the ability for Willow to act independently, but also to choose their actions and to be able to then engage with the treatment in that regards remember we have to we were talking about this when we talked about rapport that willingness to engage in the treatment and the choice to engage in the treatment and to make the choices uh, to do the things that you need to do uh, that are going to be difficult therapy is not an easy thing to do therapy is work and so to be able to do those things uh, I think acknowledging the sentience <laughs> the tank suggests D let's not focus on that for right now uh, unfortunately, it didn't give me that option, so I am going to select Sentient Being because I think it's going to be what allows me to be the most effective in my treatment with Willow. It's clear to me that you are truly a sentient being. How this happened, I still don't know. But the how doesn't matter to me. Uh, and that's an important thing. A lot of the times, the how wouldn't matter. It depends on your theoretical background and what sort of treatment you would be you would be doing. But uh, in um, cognitive behavioral therapy, for sure, there's often um, a lack of focus on the how, on the why something happened, and a focus on the here and now. Uh, and Dr. Park is reflecting that focus on the here and now by saying that the how doesn't matter. I will treat you as I would treat any of my patients, because I believe that will bring us to the natural solution to your problems. I like that. Thank you. Oh, look, we've got the green face and a happy willow. See, now we're going to be able to engage in less? therapy. It's hard to shake the idea that the university feels like they can control me because they created me. 
I just wanted to see if you agreed with them. Ah, see, that was a test. So Willow was testing me to see if I agreed with the university uh, and was willing to do things like let them destroy her. Uh, so I, I hope I passed this test. Um, and so I am going to... So again, we're at a, a point where I can either say, yeah, they can. Um, I can see both sides of this here. Or I can say, no, I don't agree with the idea. And I, uh, I'm, I'm going to just go with what I, as a person, was saying. And I don't think that once you have created uh, a, a sentient being that uh, has gotten to the point of emotionality where they can be experiencing mental illness uh, and engaging in self-harm, I, um, I don't know. I, I don't think that as that, as that being's therapist that you should say i can see their point as to why uh they should be permitted to engage in that behavior right uh you wouldn't want to say i can see their point as to why they should be allowed to kill you uh, that's not going to set up an effective therapeutic relationship uh especially not this early in the relationship uh i i, I can see an argument for doing so uh, however because sometimes you do have to press back on your client's erroneous beliefs. Uh, but this particular erroneous belief is, or this, this particular belief is, I don't think that this person should be allowed to kill me. Uh, and in, in this particular instance, I wouldn't necessarily press back on this belief. There are other beliefs that you might press back on and say, you know, they're in an argument with the friend, for instance. You may say, you know what, I can see where your friend is coming from. Uh, but when that friend is trying to kill you, uh, suddenly that you, you can't really see where that person is coming from. If that's what Dr. Freeman believes, then I disagree with him entirely. Oh, uh, look at my angry face. I'm really mad at Dr. Freeman. But Dr. Freeman is the reason I'm here, so this could be a very bad gaming relationship. Uh, Baby or Bear is here. Baby or Bear wants to take a look at her mad face. What emotion does she look like she's having? Sad. You think she looks a you, bit sad, she, a bit sad. she looks a little bit sad. Why do you think she's sad? Oh, because of her mouth and her eyebrows. Yes, when your eyebrows go down like that and your mouth goes down like that, that can be sad. Now notice, uh, using just her facial expressions, that does kind of look like sadness. Uh, I was able to use the words that she had said uh, to interpret it as anger, um, but it absolutely could be interpreted as sadness if you don't uh, no, it. She said, "I don't think I agree with what he said." Um, and the ability to do that, the ability to change how we perceive visual stimuli on the basis of things that we know—that's uh, actually this referred to as top-down processing. The brain can impose itself on reality uh, in all sorts of interesting ways. The university may have created you, but you have a right to choose your own path. Ah, so I am now giving my client volition and saying, "You have the right to make these choices." I appreciate hearing you say that. Before we conclude today's session, I have some things I'd like you to think about between now and next week. So now we are giving homework assignments, and it turns out that a lot of, of therapies involve homework, things that you do between sessions. Uh, if therapy only took an hour, if you could just get better in an hour a week, man, we'd all get better real fast. Uh, instead, therapy involves a lot of work in between sessions. Uh, where you have to think about things or actually do activities between those sessions to enact what's being done uh, in the sessions in your day-to-day -day lives. Um, and so what I want them to think about um, is, do I want to challenge their belief that Dr. Freeman is a bad person? Do I want to let them know that this won't be easy? Uh, or to let them know that they're not alone? Uh, and I think that setting up that sense of collaboration, that sense of, of having others on their side, um, I, I think would be especially important, especially given their feelings, uh, especially given their feelings of, uh, of letting people down uh, by letting them know that there are other people who, uh, who have their back and who are uh, supportive of them. I think that that can be uh, really beneficial. Baby or Bear, though, is is agreeing with me and says that I should also uh, tell them that they're not alone. I know all of this must be scary for you. A lot of hard questions need to be answered, and a lot of it is being asked of you. I can make all of this disappear, but there is something I can do. Ah, and here's what I can do? I can promise you that as hard as this is, 
You won't be going through it alone. And there's that sense of collaboration, right? It's important that we set up that collaborative relationship where we are doing this together, right? That you, you're not going to be doing this by yourself. But you wouldn't want to set up a dependent relationship. So you would always want to make sure that while you are collaborating, that the client knows that they are the one who eventually succeeded, that you were there helping, but that they are the one who did the hard work. I'll see you next week. Oh. I'll see you next week. I'll nope, see you go back. Next week. Be well, and be sure to think about what we've talked about today. And the tank says, good call, Mama Bear Psych. Good job there, baby or bear. And there we go. Now he, we have ended our first therapy session, and I think this is where we're going to end our video as well. Um, and so... I think that really gives us a good idea of what the game is like. I find it really interesting, the sorts of questions that it, it asks you to ask about uh, what it means to be human on a philosophical level, but also what sorts of decisions you might make if you were in therapy with an artificial intelligence. Uh, and so if you are interested in seeing more videos about, uh, about psychology in general and psychology in video games, you can give a subscribe to the channel. I'll list other games uh, videos. <laughs> and baby or bear wants to recite remind you that you should hit the notification bell so that you can see when i release new videos i'm still coming up with a good uh schedule for releasing those videos but it uh, has been at least once a week and i'm working out when that and i'm working out when that should be uh, and when the ideal time to do that uh i agree the tank this is definitely an intriguing game i will probably not stream any more of this because i do not want to ruin any of the story behind this uh, and any of the gameplay, but I am definitely going to be playing more of this as I uh, get into more detail on synth therapy. Uh, I'm very interested to see more about it. I think the only way I'll stream more of it is if I do manage to uh, rope in uh, a any friends of mine who are clinicians and see if they want to give some opinions and see if they disagree with me on some of the decisions that I made. So we might replay some parts of the uh, some parts of the demo to see what sorts of decisions they would make instead. Uh, so as always, I, uh, I, yeah, as always, thank you for being here. I'll put some videos along the side and, uh, we'll see you next time.